Hello everyone uh, and welcome to our second session in a series of special live webinars from Zero Waste Scotland on behalf of the Scottish Government. My name is Victoria Irvin and I work in the communications team here at Zero Waste Scotland and today we're going to be looking at the current public consultations for delivering a circular economy in Scotland with a particular focus on the topic of embedding circular construction practices. Now that means I'm going to try and mitigate my urge to use terms such as we need concrete ideas or let's build a foundation for a solid sustainable future, but they will slip in here and there I'm sure. Um, as part of our discussion today we'll also be taking your questions live. So, for anyone not fully aware, there are currently two complementary consultations available for input. The first being proposals for a circular economy bill itself, and the second titled Delivering a Circular Economy, a route map to 2025 and beyond. Both are open for responses until Monday the 22nd of August, so you do have some time to input, and that's why we're talking today. So to support the consultations and the CE bill in more general, we're calling this series of webinars as well as our communications around the consultations Living Circular, because essentially that's what it's all about, making this shift to a more circular way of living. And so I'm delighted today to be joined by our guest panel of speakers. In this session, they'll be discussing the scope of the CE bill consultations, specifically focusing on construction, as well as answering any questions that you might have. So I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves and I will start with Jane, uh, you're at the top corner of my screen. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, my name is Jane Beasley and I am the project lead for uh, the route map within Zero Waste Scotland. Fantastic, thank you, Jane. And Jim? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Brannan and I'm Head of Supply Chain Sustainability for Procurement for Balfour Beaky in Scotland. Brilliant, thank you, Jim. And Stephen? Well, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Boyle, and I'm the head of the construction program at Zero Waste Scotland. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. And Tom? I'm Tom Warren. I'm an impact manager within the sustainability team at Built Environment Smarter Transformation, formerly known as Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone, and a warm welcome to the session. So the webinar today is being brought to you live. However, if you need to leave before the end or if you've just joined us, you can catch up later as it's been recorded and it will be available to view online, either through our social channels or our dedicated CE Bill microsite that you can find at livingcircular.scot. So, as also mentioned, we're encouraging questions and I will be reminding you throughout uh, that you can submit these um, at, during the session and afterwards. You can either um, use the chat element on this live feed the hashtag living circular on social or by emailing living circular at zerowayscotland.org.uk. Any questions that we don't get to today, we will strive to come back to you as soon as possible. So the format today is as follows. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to Jane, who will do a broad introduction to the CE bill and route map consultations, and then we'll pose some questions to the panel as well. In the second half of the session, Jane's going to take a deeper dive into package five of the route map on embedding circular construction practices. And we will then end the webinar with a detailed Q&A on that. And I know that we've got a lot of thoughts to get through today, so I'm sure that that will take up a nice chunk of time. So again, please do submit your questions. And as we go through them, we'll be able to come back to you with uh, some great expertise and uh, experience. We've already seen some questions come through as well, which is brilliant. But before we get on to them, I'm going to hand over to Jane, who will now give us an introduction to both consultations. Thank you, Victoria. So very, very warm welcome to everyone to our lunchtime webinar series, where we are focusing on very specific areas or themes within the route map and the circular economy bill. So I'm just going to start by giving a really quick overview of the consultation documents and providing some context to the discussions that we're having at the moment. So the route map and the circular economy bill are complementary, as Victoria said. They are designed to help us move from a take, make, dispose model to a much more circular way of living, keeping materials in use for longer. Now, the need to speed up and make more progress um, in changing how we do things is really apparent and has actually become much more pressing in re recent years. We're aware that around four fifths of Scotland's carbon footprint comes from products and services that we manufacture, that we use and then we throw away. In addition, we recognise that 90% of global biodiversity loss and water stress is caused by resource extraction and processing. Therefore, we do need to act. And whilst progress has been made in this space, we need to do more and we need to do it at speed. I'm not sure if Jane might have cut off there. I know that she has a bit of temperamental internet that likes to choose the best moments uh, in order to, to take uh, 
take control. So we will be able to welcome her back just shortly, but I can step in at the moment. And it also is worth noting, I, I know that um, for those who might have joined our session last week, um, Jane did go through these already, so I know this might be a bit of repetition for someone, but always good to labour a message when it's something as important as this. And I can see that Jane's internet has kindly let her come back in now. Are you with us, Jane? I am, yes. <laughs> Thank you. It's, I think there's a little devil in my internet that always tries to cut me off. So in essence, the route map is building on what we've already done. It's looking at achievements and actions that are already in way. It's really focusing on those targets that we've got to meet up to 25 and then looking beyond. So in terms of what are the measures are needed to develop much more circular systems and support our carbon ambitions. So the route map is a call to action. We need to work together as stakeholder groups. We have to bring about change collectively. And if you've had a chance to look through the content, then you'll actually notice that there is a do develop investigate framework approach to the interventions and measures. So that recognizes that actually not all of the policy measures and proposals are fully ready to be implemented in Scotland. So some need more uh, research or refining, some need more work on their feasibility and appropriateness in that space. The other point to mention is the route map specifies legislative requirements to give us the powers to act. So that's indicated by a little cross next to specific interventions and measures, and that should show the clear linkages across the CE bill. So in terms of the actual detail, the route map is split into seven different packages. We're going to be looking at package five in more detail in a little while. So package one is promoting responsible consumption, production, reuse. And if you missed it, we had a webinar on that just a couple of weeks ago. That's on our website. So go take a look. That's very much focused on upstream measures to prevent waste generation, maximize value um, from resources through looking at sustainable product choices and also ensuring that we can optimize the use of products and materials that are already in circulation. The next package is reducing food waste, and this is very much aligned to the Food Waste Reduction Action Plan. This addresses the whole food waste system. It resets our attitude to food waste and looks at how we can en enhance the circular bioeconomy in this space and also give us better data to understand the progress made. We've got improved recycling from household. Um, the big focus in here is all about making recycling much easier than disposal, looking at how we can design and deliver our services to maximize that performance that we're looking for, achieve more consistency in local services, look at how we can share best practice and support local authorities, and really look at how we can embed decision-making about recycling in the design and the sale of products, and also reuse and repair measures as well. It's about increasing transparency and generating much more confidence in the processes in place. We have improved recycling from commercial businesses. So this is looking at improving the commercial data that we've got, making sure that we're very clear on what's been recycled, what has the potential to be recycled, what opportunities are we missing? It's about providing incentives for commercial industries and businesses to increase their reuse and recycling, and also supporting investment in this space. Package five we're doing today, that's embedding circular construction practices with a real significant focus on reuse and embodied carbon, looking at how we can collaborate, promote best practice, work together and so on. We'll be diving into that in a little while. We have minimizing the impact of disposal. This is recognizing that there will still be some elements of the material stream and the waste stream that we are gonna to have to manage. So it's how do we manage those in the most appropriate way? So it's about encouraging innovation whilst maintaining stability in this space. It's looking at how we can explore different approaches, including targeted approaches to things like the landfill tax. And then we have cross-cutting measures. So these are the things that really sort of impact across all the different packages. We've got strategic interventions, which has got the circular economy strategy within it, monitoring framework, associated targets. We've got research data and evidence needs. So that's looking at programs of research that are underway and will be coming underway, behavioral change, fiscal incentives, and material specific priorities. We've got sustainable procurement. So we recognize the important role that procurement can play um, in delivering more sustainable and circular practices. And then last but definitely not least, we've got skills and training. There's a need for a greater uptake of, of green skills and the opportunities they present. And we are actually running a, a specific webinar on that in August. Looking now at the circular economy bill. So the route map identifies potential interventions and sets that clear direction of travel for the next five to 10 years. But the bill includes the legislative provisions that will help us deliver some of those interventions that are in the route map, but also extends into other areas as well. So it's not exclusively for the route map. So the program for government 21-22 did include a commitment to bring forward a circular economy bill. And the aim of it is to help facilitate an economy which then reduces demand for raw materials, looks at how we can design products to last longer and encourages reuse, repair and recycling. 
So the consultation builds on previous measures that have been out for consultation and also introduces some new proposals, which includes, but not exclusively, the legislative provisions for the route map. So in terms of the detail of the bill, so the content does go beyond route map and it's split into four sections. So we've got strategic interventions and sitting with that, within that are the circular economy strategy obligations and the statutory targets. We have reduce and reuse and included in there are measures to ban the destruction of unsold durable goods, environmental char charging for single use items and mandatory reporting of waste and surplus. We have recycle, which is about strengthening the approach to the household uh, recycling charter looking at targets to support recycling performance, duty of care for householders and business recycling collection zone feasibility. And then we have littering and improvement enforcement. So that's littering from vehicles and seizures of vehicles involved in waste crime. Now, don't worry if this is a bit difficult to read. Uh, this illustration is actually features in both the route map of the circular economy bill. It's a useful illustration, but it is a snapshot. OK, and it literally is just a tiny snapshot of what we're covering. The route map's got 39 interventions, then the, the bill reflects a number of those and some more. But it actually is really, really useful to draw a couple of things from it. So firstly, there isn't a single measure that will solve the problems that we're facing at the moment. Um, a single approach is not enough. The interactions between the different kind of packages of proposals and between the different measures are really, really important to drive the change that we need. Also, it's worth noting there is a significant amount of activity taking place up to 2025. There's a real mix of measures. Some are enabling, some are direct interventions. And in particular, there is a lot of work packages already underway for 22-23. So finally, these consultations are very much the start of a national conversation in this space. We have made some strong progress in reducing emissions in the waste and resources sector over the last 20 years. We have taken significant strides to try and tackle Scotland's throwaway culture and promote recycling. The bill intends to increase the levers that we have available to us and the route map sets out the actions to really accelerate that progress. But we do recognise that the circular economy bill and the, route and the waste policy space is a really, really complex landscape. So we do need legislative and non-legislative measures, and that's reflected, I hope, in both of the consultation documents. So what we need now is for you to share with us your views so that we can continue to work together and we can make the progress that we need to make in order to live much more sustainably and protect our resources and the wider environment. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jane. That's it's a great overview and, and to get that kind of detail as well, because like you say, it is all about listening to the views and getting input from everyone across the board so that we can move together uh, collectively. So that's fantastic. Um, so we are getting some questions trickling in, which is brilliant. Great to see support and interest in the consultation uh, so quickly. I think I'd like to pose the first question actually to yourself, Jane. You're just, just done speaking and making you speak again here. Um, what consultation should stakeholders seek to complete? Which one would you say is, is maybe most important? Thanks, Victoria. That, that's a really good question because they are two, you know, quite beefy documents. There's a lot to take in. Um, they're very different documents, though. So you have the route map, which is the strategic document that's full of actions and measures to speed up that progress. The bill is obviously the primary legislative requirements that we need. I would say that you would need to look at both documents, but you can focus in the areas of where your specialisms, your expertise, your knowledge lies. You don't have to complete all of the consultation responses attached to both. So cherry pick, go in, have a look at the areas that interest you most and where you want to kind of share your views with us um, and just feed your responses accordingly. But both equally important. Amazing. And how are um, responses submitted? How is it that people can, can actually get involved uh, with taking part? So you can submit your responses by either going through Scottish Government um, on the website or you can access the consultation documents through our Living Circular, which, Victoria, I believe you'll give that address out at the end. Um, and you can just find the link. It's really straightforward. You don't have to do it all in one go. You can go on, you can submit some responses, save it, come back. Um, you have until the 22nd of August to get your responses in. Um, so take your time, but don't take too long. Um, don't miss the deadline. But it's, it's very, very straightforward. Amazing, thank you. I know August seems so far away, but we're already on the 21st of July, so I agree. It's Don't don't see the leisure of time when it can go so quickly. No, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, and I'd now like to pose a question to our external guests today, Tom and Jim, who we're very thrilled to have you with us. I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but I'm also putting you on the spot. Um, are you both planning on submitting responses to the consultations or have you done so already? 
Um, I'll take this first, Tom, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, yeah. we are planning on uh, submitting uh, responses to the bill. In fact, I've already attended some uh, one about three, four weeks ago with the minister responsible for the bill, which was a very challenging and interesting workshop. So, yes, we, we fully intend to um, with this Balfour Beatty, but I'm also working with the Supply Chain Sustainability School with other partners to try and coordinate uh, some responses as well that, that really gets a joined up view of uh, what we should be looking at. Brilliant. And what about yourself, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really important piece of uh, consultation. Um, we're um, within our sustainability team at BEST. Uh, we're leading on on our approach to the consultation. Um, the first part of that is to uh, go out to our innovation champions uh, who, who come from industry and supply chain to, to, I'm sure many of them individually will be making responses, but um, we're keen to, you know, to to be listening to our own network as well um so uh, and yeah we'll be making sure then that's all collated in advance of the deadline on the 22nd excellent gold stars for both of you um and i know obviously jane and stephen uh obviously you have also taken part in the consultations yourself perhaps um stephen i'll put this one to you how do you find the process of submitting a response i think when people hear consultations and see all the detail of the packages it can feel like it might be an overwhelming process but could you give a little bit of insight into how it kind of how you felt going through the process of it? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the the, the consultation itself, uh, you know, it is the two chunky documents. Uh, but by all means, look at those those areas which are the most important to you, and hone in on those questions which you have an opinion and some evidence and thoughts on. Um, you don't actually need to answer every single question. It's good if you understand the background, uh, but really, really focus in on those things which are really important to you and you have answers and evidence for. But yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, yeah, I think the overall uh, call to action there, August 22nd, doesn't take too long. It's very important to do. So thank you so much for answering that. We've got a lot to ponder upon, um, so we're still getting some questions coming through. I want to keep those to um, just after the second se uh, second part of the session, because I'm aware that we've got a lot of thoughts um, and suggestions to get through. So I'm going to actually pass back to Jane at the moment just to go and introduce the route map to 2025 package five, and then we'll move on to some questions after that. So over to you, Jane. Thanks, Victoria. Fingers crossed, no glitching. Who knows? You handle it very well there, so it's fine. OK, so I'm going to take a deeper look into package five, which is what we're all here for, embedding circular construction practices. So the focus of this package is all about improving resource use in construction. So remembering that existing targets are the main driver in the short to medium term, but then we need to consider much wider environmental ambitions that we have. So it's all about ensuring that we reduce resource needs, we support and drive forward re uh, reuse and refurbishment, and we reduce waste generation and carbon. So construction demolition waste accounts for around half of all waste that's produced in Scotland. And actually a relatively small number of sites can be responsible for a significant share of the overall arisings, but this varies year on year due to differences in construction and, and wider economic activity. There isn't a significant trend in this waste stream and actually the variation in this waste stream is the main factor determining whether we achieve or not the 15% waste reduction target in any given year. So we want to transform current practices. We want to look at how we can ensure closer collaboration between government, public bodies and industry. We want to work together to bring about the change that we need. So we want to look at how we can incentivize sustainable construction practices, recognizing cost implications, but also opportunities that are available from reducing waste and increasing reuse. And within this package, we want to build on and promote best practice, the good practice that's already out there and ensure that the behavior change that we want is mainstreamed. It's not a niche activity. And we want to improve our understanding of the sector from a waste and resource management point of view. So in terms of what we've done, we've had the net zero public sector building standards. Now that's a voluntary standard to support public bodies to meet their net zero commitments. And objective two includes a benchmark for embodied carbon with voluntary reporting. We've got the Scottish Construction Leadership Forum's net zero group, and that's working to embed net zero practices, including identifying solutions to reduce waste, to look at operational emissions and embodied carbon, and also to support the domestic construction supply chain and sustainable materials. We've got the Circular Economy Investment Fund, which supports a range of sustainable construction solutions. And then there's a wide range of other initiatives that are underway across key stakeholders and key partners. 
Looking now in terms of what we're currently doing, we've got the JAF National Planning Framework 4. Um, that's going to help ensure that best use is made of our assets and of our infrastructures to support emissions reduction. So through this framework, planning policies have been updated to really, really reflect what opportunities arise from having a shift towards much more circular solutions. So this is supporting development, which much better reflects the hierarchy. So we're thinking about prioritizing reduction, reuse of materials and facil facilitating whatever infrastructure we need to make this possible. We have Skills, Deve uh, Skills Development Scotland, who are developing the Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan. So this includes a circular economy sustainable retrofit training program. And the possibility of mandating design for construction through building standards is currently under consideration. So this is very much in line with the Climate Assembly recommendation to introduce appropriate legislation that requires all new buildings to be designed from the outset using techniques that really enable demountability, disassembly, material recycling and reuse at end of life. So looking now at what we're proposing in the consultation. So we want to work with industry to really accelerate the adoption of best practice standards and explore options for mandatory compliance. So we really recognize that there are a number of voluntary and mandatory standards already in place, and these are designed to try and ensure efficient, effective and safe working practices. And there's also industry led groups who act as platforms for engagement and knowledge sharing. And but whilst detailed guidance does exist, it isn't always followed. And small and medium sized enterprises also can face significant barriers to adoption of voluntary practices, such as cost and time and awareness. So the proposal put forward is to review existing practices and work with industry to really understand the opportunities and the requirements for successful adoption and compliance. So a strategic plan will be developed for any new measures or standards taken forward, and there'll be a phased approach for implementation from 2023 based on material type or business or project size. So it is believed that a significant impact could be achieved on a voluntary basis, but options for mandatory compliance have to be explored at this stage. So investigate options to incentivize refurbishment of buildings by 2023. So this is about extending building life to reduce the generation of low value, high tonnage construction and demolition waste and looking at how it can significantly reduce embodied carbon emissions. It does remain common practice for existing buildings to be demolished and rebuilt rather than refurbished as a priority. So we're proposing that there needs to be research for the potential incentives for refurbishment. And then should any new policy measures be identified, the intention is to work with industry to gauge feasibility, cost and implementation needs. Coordinate a Scottish programme for reuse of construction materials and assets by 2025. So this is in order to provide a platform for construction companies to source used materials. So there are examples in place, but activity tends to be a little bit ad hoc and also relies on stakeholders to really drive the market in this space. The practice can also be relatively niche and it does face challenges in terms of supply and geography and different specifications. So a Scottish programme for reuse of construction materials would provide a coordinated approach to expanding reuse opportunities and also help build market confidence. So the programme could also deliver coordinated investment in research, in development and training and also upskilling activities. If this measure is taken forward as a first step, an industry consultation on expanding salvage and reuse will be launched and then a phased plan will be developed for implementing the programme by 2025, identifying in scope sectors, materials and construction life cycle stages. Investigate the potential use of recycling bonds to divert material from landfill. So recycling bonds in this setting would require an upfront payment that is returned when specific reuse or recycling performance targets are met. So bonds commonly used in the construction industry to protect against poor contractor performance or non-competition, guard against defaults of the company, secure use of plant or materials stored off site or for dispute resolution. So we're looking to investigate whether recycling bonds could be used to increase recycling performance and quality and to divert material from landfill. If this measure is taken forward, it will begin piloting a recycling bond by 2024 for soil and stones with a small number of partner organisations. Consider how devolved taxes can incentivise use of secondary aggregates and support circular economy practices. So the Scotland Act 2016 provided legislative powers for the introduction of a devolved aggregates levy in Scotland and following consultation, we're going to take this forward in the current session of the Scottish Parliament. 
The Scottish Government published research reviewing, modelling and analysing different options for a Scotland specific aggregates levy in 2020. And this did show that the impacts of the levy and the landfill tax are complementary. So consideration is going to be given to how both taxes can be used together to incentivise the use of secondary aggregates and support circular economy practices in this space. Work with industry to identify ways to reduce soil and stones going to landfill by 2023. So this is proposed to provide bespoke support to really reduce soil and stones waste and find alternatives for any waste that's unavoidable. If this is taken forward, then the regulatory, financial, geographic and time dependent barriers will be assessed and different ways to address these wherever possible will be identified. So the focus will be on working with industry and with CEPA to really understand availability, quality, reliability, storage needs, and also identify upcoming projects that will generate large quantities of soils and stones and to consider reuse applications which are economically viable and environmentally beneficial. And last but not least, facilitate the development of a soil symbiosis programme by 2025. So this programme would seek to establish an industry-owned platform to communicate excavation types, volumes and timings so that material can be used in other structural projects. So if feasible, a full implementation plan for the programme by 2025 will be developed. The design of any programme will be informed by the earlier actions identified with industry and the merits of voluntary and mandatory use of the programme will be explored with threshold criteria for required participation and other policy measures that can help support diversion from landfill, such as procurement requirements. And if successful, this approach should be expanded to other material streams. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jane. I know we've went through those slides already in our rehearsal, but I just find it so interesting. So it's great to see all that again, just to get that detail and that more understanding about the package five and all its details. So thank you so much for that. Um, so we're now obviously going to move on to the Q&A section. We've already had a couple come through on social. So just a reminder, I said I would keep reminding you, you can submit your questions um, either through the chat on this live stream using hashtag living circular on social channels or by emailing us at livingcircular at zerowayscotland.org.uk. But we have had a question come through on Twitter from Tamsin. Uh, thank you very much, Tamsin, for getting in touch. Stephen, I'll pose it to yourself first and then I'll happily open it to the panel. And I should also stress that with any question, while I may pose it to, to one or two of you, please, everyone, feel free to, to chip in as, again, I am aware that there's lots of thoughts on this uh, topic and we'd love to get your expertise. So Stephen, how can we embed circular construction practices when end of waste regulations prevent lots of material reuse? Okay. Okay, so um, the, f the first thing I have to say that is that a circular economy is an economy without waste. Um, so therefore, um, we, we shouldn't focus on the waste side of it, but I will come back to reuse in a moment. So the first principle, of course, is designing out waste from the start. So how can we, through planning and design, uh, remove the generation of waste during construction and end of life and to plan to recover materials uh, from the very start? And if we plan to recover the materials then you take into consideration how you can capture them, reuse them and repurpose them for future use. And therefore you can eliminate any materials which are problematic um, and remove them from the initial build. But I said I would come back to the, there is problematic materials which are difficult. But what I would also say is this, this consultation and uh, it shows the Scottish Government's commitment to reuse and to move materials and keep them at high value in our economy for longer. And we've got a very engaged environment agency in Scotland as well, who are very much behind us and who have been working with us and others to work towards end of um, sort of end of waste criteria for products. So, yeah, so it's challenging. But remember, circularity is an economy uh, without waste. Excellent. Thank you. Does anyone else have any views on that question or would you like me to move on to the next one? I think Stephen covered it quite eloquently there. I think all waste should be eliminated as far as possible and we need to any waste that is generated keep it at its highest level for reuse uh, without generating more waste so and um, yeah fantastic thank you i'm going to go back to stephen as well for this question that was posed to us just before the um before we went live in terms of the proposed new actions outlined uh, just there by jane what would you say are the most essential if we're to meet the target to reduce waste by 15 percent so if we focus again on waste here and the 15% target, the very, if we look at the short term, then we have to look at the 
part of the waste stream, which is the highest val highest volume, which is our stone, soil and stone. And there's lots of initiatives in these two consultations, which are there to help address and, and tackle those two materials. Um, the soil and stone, we can reuse it, repurpose it, recycled aggregate is, a, is being used um, within the industry at high levels. But what can we do more to reprocess that and use that more in the industry. And we've got things in there learning about industrial symbiosis. Now, in industrial symbiosis with cut and fill balances, understanding how you can transfer materials between two different organisations um, in, in partnership with the, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency on those waste regulations. Again, these, are very, they, these can be done and they can be worked and they can be extremely successful. Um, there's many examples of this. Um, if you look at the, the Syria guidance on sustainable champions, in that guidance, there's a case study in there on the A19 Highways England, which showed that two different projects within that A9 can share materials and cut the amount of soil and stone requirement for one project from the surplus from another. And that saved that project a million pounds. So it's not just uh, it's not just about the the saving and the reductions in waste. It is actually also economically um, advantageous to do this as well. Fantastic, one million pound. That's very impressive. Um, thank you so much, Stephen. And we've also got a question come through for uh, Tom. So from your perspective of working across the construction sector, is what's being proposed within the consultation feasible? Can it be done and what role does BEST have to play here? Yeah, thanks, Victoria. Um, definitely it can be done and there's a real urgency uh, about doing this. Um, I was pleased to see there's reference there to potential mandatory standards because I think um, some of this, you know, needs a level playing field across the supply chain so that, um, you know, um, you know, industry knows where investment can be made for that longer term commitment. Um, so um, obviously there's challenges around that and, and, and costs and things, but um, yeah, the, the certainty around legislation and the level playing field, I think is really important. In terms of what BEST is, is doing and, and kind of promoting and, and working with industry partners on, um, for the, the, you know, the built environment is a long-term investment. Um, so decisions that are made now and, and the kind of early early specification and uh, good collaboration between um, all, the, all the different stakeholders in, in a development is um, is key to getting this stuff right. So, you know, Stephen's touched on designing out waste, um, you know, designing for, for deconstruction, um, but also, you know, optimization for, for future flexibility so that buildings being built now are adaptable. Um, you know, ideally we want to do deep retrofit on the built, the built environment where we already have. Um, and you know the, the selection of uh, more natural materials, so that we're, we're specifying and putting materials in which can be uh, reused, or you know they're, they're part of that circular economy, either in terms of the sourcing, or we're not we're not creating problems down the line. Fantastic, thank you so much. And I'm going to now come to Jim. Um, who's got a lovely day behind him there, I can see. Um, Jim, how do we collaborate as an industry to make the changes proposed? Um, this is a question that continuously comes up in, in every um, aspect of workshops that we've I've been involved in over the last God knows how many years. Collaboration is, is so important, but we need to collaborate with the right conditions. And those conditions need to be right at the start of any project. And I mean right at the start way back at the start at the design phase because that's when you can make the biggest impact we need to get collaboration with the, the client the customer the, the architect the designer the cost engineer and the the, the the main project um management company and the supply chain themselves because they have the ideas that will generate the best solutions that will reduce um, you know, any given waste stream in any given project. So we need to, we get focused on, and I, I use this term, terms and conditions a lot. I would like to see T's and C's being replaced as trust and collaboration as opposed to terms and conditions. So if we had trust and collaboration right at the start, right at the very start, that would be uh, what I'd like to see. And I think we can, we need to change the rules of the game in order to kind of mandate that in, in some kind of legislative way, a uh, national planning framework four could could you know could well be um, 
part of that. Uh, I know it's voluntary, but I think we need to to move away from that kind of voluntary um, approach, and, and we need to make it more solid um, in terms of maybe a, a legislative requirement to 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 really coordinate um, at the start of any given project. Fantastic, thank you, Jim. Tom, I could see you nodding away there. Do you want to build on that at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with what Jim's saying. I, I think there's a stage even before design, which is at the client, at the, at the procurement of of design teams, of the purposes. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, some of these decisions need to be made right at the start of the briefing stage. Um, but I think clients, uh, you know, need support with that. You know, this is this is new territory for many organisations. Uh, Jane in the presentation touched on the on the, the kind of public sector support and the voluntary standards there, um, but you know right across the the built environment uh, uh, client sector, um, it's that education and support that, that's needed um, so that they're asking the right questions of of the, the stakeholders and and you know early early, early professional consultants that are involving. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We've had another question come through on Facebook from Michelle. So I'm just going to open it out to the full panel, whoever whoever wants to answer. What would success look like in the short term regarding adoption of uh, circular economy practices? Anyone wants to take that one? <laughs> just throwing it out there. Can, um, can, I, I'll, can I just oh. pop in really quickly? Sorry, it's just as a as a sort of an overview um, opinion on this. I, I think consistency because there is really good practice out there it's just not consistently applied and it's some of the steps that need to be taken to ensure um, that there is a much more uh, consistent adoption of good practice or best practice however you want to define it would be a really really good sort of first start um, the challenge is getting that consistency and making sure the levers and the measures are appropriate to ensure that that happens. But once you start the ball rolling on that, it can happen quite quickly. Brilliant. Thank you. Stephen, were you, were you wanting to say something as well there? It's, yeah. always, a, it's always a struggle to come off mic at the same time, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I'm going to dive into a little bit of a wider picture here on the circular economy. It is an economic um, uh, model. Um, and, and, and when you look at the different things you put in place, what it's doing is it's, re it's, it's looking at reducing consumption and managing your resources better, and then you reusing those within our own economy here in Scotland and, uh, and, and perpetuating that over time and time again. And what that does is, is um, especially when carbon is taken into it, you're, you're looking at local supplies, the, re the recapture of those materials and the repurposing and reuse of them, those are local jobs. So it helps and supports local economies here. Reducing materials right at the beginning reduces the cost in a build and the, the reduction in waste. Again, it, it, it reduces costs. Um, so, and, and, you know, with new jobs comes social and economic benefits to individuals as well. So there, there is a number of different factors uh, which the circular economy can do. And if, as we see it being adopted more, um, you, you, you begin to see those uh, benefits uh, come through. Excellent, thank you so much, that's brilliant. Um, another question has come through for yourself, Tom. In terms of innovative ways to reduce general construction materials going to landfill, are there already best practice examples out there in terms of what is economically viable and environmentally beneficial that the consultation can learn from? It's a bit of a wordy one. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good uh, robust question there. Um, so the, I guess there's two parts. There's the, the buildings that we don't have, the future planning that I was talking about in terms of you know, best practice, in terms of uh, designing out waste. Um, but obviously most of the built environment we already have and is going to be with us, with us for a very long time yet. So um, maybe as a as a, a successful example that we're you know it's great to see in Scotland is the work of the organization Canotech with their K-Brick. Um, so for those not familiar with that, they have a, um, uh, a recycled brick uh, product uh, which is unfired. Um, it's got 90% demolition construction waste um, in its in its form. Um, and and that model you know is has been developed and, and established in Scotland, but you know potentially has global application. 
Um, so yeah, absolutely looking at um, the economies, as Stephen said there, you know, it's it's got to be a, an economy where um, waste is, is, is actually a resource. Um, um, so I think that's, you know, that's a great, uh, a great success story from, uh, from kind of tech there. Fantastic, thank you. Anyone else want to build on that? I've, that, I told you I would end up making accidental puns. I do apologise, but <laughs> if, if not, I'm happy to move on to another question that we've been posed for yourself, Jim. Um, so you're an advocate for net zero and you already work closely with Zero Waste Scotland and other bodies to reduce waste and embed circular construction practices. Is there anything more that you'd like to see in the actions proposed across the built and route map specifically? Um, in terms of, of the discussions that we've had internally so far within Balfour Beatty and also externally with other bodies, I think what we do need to do is we need to be really ambitious in terms of setting some hard targets um, and not having soft targets. It's great having lots of words, but we need to be kind of granular and a bit specific and, and kind of have those targets that we can agree upon embedded into the um, the bill but but I'd like to see those targets backed up with some legislation that that doesn't make it voluntary, but does make it uh, a more mandatory requirement. Now, what those look like and what they can be, that's what we are really consulting on, and that, and that for me um, is something that is really important. That that we are ambitious. We do need to accelerate. We've seen from a from a you know a climate emergency point of view, um, we've we've had it this week. Uh, where we've all suffered badly from from the um, incredible heat that we've seen over the last couple of days. So um, more ambition on targets and having those targets specific uh, in terms of circularity, I would like to see that because we have to create the demand at the client side, the customer side. And we need to try and get away from this, what I call Monte Casino uh, tendering in terms of going to the lowest cost and not coming up with the best solution but the cheapest solution, let's come up with the best solution that is built to last and not just let's get it done cheap and cheap and cheerful. That ain't, that ain't the way to do things going forward. We have to change those rules and we have to be really bold and ambitious in changing them. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Jim. That actually leads really nicely into um, a question that we thought would just be very, very stark and ask. So I'm going to open this up to the, the full panel as I know that there are a lot of opinions um, but I'll pose it to yourself first of all, Tom. Overall, in your opinion, do the measures go far enough in these proposals? And what other measures would you like to see in there? That was such a good question that Tom dropped off. Uh, <laughs> it blew him away um, on his back. So <laughs> did yeah. you manage to, the, the internet gremlins are out in force today. I know. Sorry for that. <laughs> I, I think I, I think I caught I think I caught your question there, which was, do this does this go far enough? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think Jim was touching on that before. Uh, no, um, but we've got this consultation opportunity for people to to input if, if they feel likewise. Um, yeah, the, you know, I think the mandatory statutory requirement is is probably where, where this needs to be. Um, the, I mean, I, I was thinking in the in the description there earlier. It, it's a bit like fast fashion, and we all know the issues around that. But you know, if we, th if we think about that analogy for the built environment, for buildings and, and other infrastructure, um, you know, we don't want fast buildings. Um, we want we want them to be sustainable and, and purposeful. Um, you know, for for the, the the longevity. Brilliant, thank you. And then I'll I'll pose it to Jim as well. Obviously, we're touching upon your opinion uh, in the last question, but I'm aware that you also said you'd met with Miss Slater and had discussions with her as well. So I think you've definitely let your feelings be known. So feel free to use this as a platform too. Uh, no, I, 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 I um, had the pleasure of four weeks ago um, to attend an event, uh, which was um, just after the, the launch of the consultation. Uh, and uh, there was um, about 25 to 30 like-minded people in the room uh, along with um, myself and Miss Slayer. Um, and we made our feelings known that, that we wanted to be, we want this to be really ambitious and, and push yourself in a way that, that we need to accelerate the change. We need to change the rules. We can't just tinker at the edges. We really need to get down and dirty in terms of getting some real hard targets in there. And that was a conversation I had. Um, and, and I think she really appreciated that 
kind of um, free thought on on, um, on where we were coming from uh, in the room, and everyone was was of the same view. Yeah, we really need to get hard on what we need to do to make this a reality in terms of making those changes and creating the conditions that allows us to move to a, a more circular way of doing business. Yeah. Absolutely. And just on my my iconic background is built to last um <laughs> with most railroads. So there, there's you know, we were doing it hundreds hundreds of years ago uh, and and uh, you know so we can we can do this. Yeah. Brilliant. Excellent, Jim. You're literally the poster boy for circular construction there <laughs> with your background. Um, and then what about yourself, Stephen? Same question to you. Do you feel that these were... <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Jim's built the last thing there. I mean, the circular economy is actually the way that the that the world and the the world worked over a hundred years ago before we went into the linear economy, but that's again going into the, the nuances of it. Um, is it enough? No. Of course it's not enough um but it's a start uh, and it's a it's a decent start um but we do want people to hear what people think should be the next steps and, and if there is anything new that can be done now i mean i do agree with jim um that uh, we need we need change and we need behavior change within the industry i believe from the commitments that i've heard from industry so far jim and his colleagues across the industry when i hear them that they are ready to do it if we are if they're asked on a level playing field to do it and do it they will do it um and they're ready to do it and they know how to do it because we can build better um so yes i think that we're ready to do it we do need change and i do think we do need some of these measures in the circular economy bill as regulations uh, not just as guidance um what else would i have liked to have seen in the bill um there, there could be um there, there is talk about deconstruction uh, plans, deconstruction audits, um, like to see these coming in. Um, if you can't take action unless you actually understand where resources are and waste is coming from. So greater understanding uh, and things like deconstruction audits, they all plan for them and you understand where the waste is so you can actually take action. And from knowing where the waste streams are coming from and the resource potential resources come from, then you can take action in the wider economy to put in place measures such as reprocessing plants, remanufacturing plants to take all of these secondary materials for reuse. So it helps and supports not just the construction sector, but the supporting industries as well in the supply chain. So all these things uh, are all linked. And I think um, like that, that measure will help. But I would have liked us to have seen a little bit more on embodied carbon. Um, and I think that's a, a real topic for conversation uh, that I'd like to pick up. And I'll leave it there. No, it's very, very, very interesting. Thank you so much, Stephen. And what about yourself, Jane? What's your thoughts? Um, I mean, completely agree with everything that's been said. I think we probably have to keep at the forefront of our mind that the kind of short term objectives are delivery against targets. But we do have to have that eye on the sort of longer term ambitions and where we really need to be sort of pushing towards. And, you know, you, the question, you know, is it enough? Do we ever go far enough? I don't think you should ever answer yes to that at any stage where you are in policy, because, you know, we are addressing really, really significant challenges. We are in a climate emergency. We do have to make really big changes. So I think what, you know, what we need to kind of focus on is are there elements within uh, the proposals, the seven interventions that are being put forward? They're fairly broad, some of them. So are there some really sort of concrete steps that you think need to be put in place to ensure that they can be effectively delivered? Are there sort of must haves, must do's? Um, you can feed that back through the consultation. You know, is it the, the detail? We need to get the kind of delivery detail right. So is there anything specific that's missing and that would really sort of enhance and help sort of drive that forward and, and beef it up um, in certain areas? And I've seen the, the questions that's come up about SMEs. This is a, a classic example. You know, if we're pushing things forward and we have to bring SME sector along with us, then are the support mechanisms in place? Are they appropriate? How are we kind of reaching out and making sure that everyone is bringing it? We're trying to elevate everyone to a really high standard and we're trying to change how we do things. That's a big ask. It's a big behavioral change ask. It's, you know, it's a significant um, opportunity that needs to be realized, but change does, it's quite scary. Um, so we just need to capitalize on that and make sure that we have 
those support frameworks in to tell us in the consultation, flag up where you think an interventional measure is going to fall flat on its face or not be effective if we don't do X, Y, Z. That's brilliant. Thank you, Jane. And you just uh, nodded there towards a question that's come through on Facebook from Jennifer, just when I was ready to wrap up after this. But that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, she asked the uh, construction and demolition industry is largely SME organisations in rural and remote Scotland. Many little awareness uh, of circular economy and few with circular economy business plans. The barriers to this are diverse and Jennifer wonders how we best support such organisations to meet the proposed targets and support their progress to a circular economy within the route map. I'm loving the detail of these questions. So, um, yeah, I suppose I could pop that to yourself first, Jim, if you care to answer. Yeah, I think uh, it's a great point. Um, we, we um, It's a concern to us in Balfour BT and, and one of the things that we have been looking at is how do we reach out to the supply chain to identify where they are in terms of their circular economy and net zero plans. What do they have in place or where are the gaps? And that's something that we are working on with our supply chain. Then we'll identify what those gaps are and we've got uh, what we're calling signposting for support that we can get either through Scottish Government, Zero Waste Scotland, CITB um, and other organisations. So what we are working on with with our supply chain within Balfour Beatty is to do exactly that, is do a gap analysis based on what we where we need our supply chain to be to, to really understand how they can transform uh, to become this net zero circular solution that we need them to be. So so we're doing that as Balfour Beatty and you know we will be working on supply chain to help and support them to make that transition in, in both practical terms, maybe financial terms, putting them in, in touch with the right organisations that can help them. So uh, that's what we're doing um, as Balfour BT. We're working with other partners we'll like Zero Waste Scotland, Supply Chain Sustainability School as well, which, which is a great uh, resource, uh, which is free at point of use. Um, so we're, we're doing, there's lots of free stuff out there and we just need to point the supply chain in the direction of that, that will help them as well. So it's, it's not all about, it's gonna cost a whole lot of money. It, it, in a lot of cases, it's free, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. And Tom, I could see you nodding again. Would you like to add to that? Yeah, you'd think this was pre-prepared. Jim's nicely set up what I was going to say next. Um, oh, right. We just met you. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, so in terms of that free support, um, you know, an open offer for, for anyone, particularly in the, uh, you know, the SMEs within the rural, remote um, uh, parts of Scotland that, you know, best built advanced smart transformation is there as part of that support ecosystem, um, working with SOCI in the south of Scotland and High, uh, High and Sands Enterprise in the, in the Highlands and Islands, um, which is my specific uh, geographic remit. So, um, yeah. Please, please get in touch with us if, if you want specific support around that. And, and as Jim said, there are others, and you know, working with the industry supply chains. But yeah, we all need to help, help have fun on that journey. That's certainly a challenge. Absolutely, definitely. The theme of togetherness and, and working with each other is, is coming through today. And Jane, you, you were kind of touched on the question uh, within your last response, but do you want to add to it at all? Yeah, just really to, to bring back to the point that one of the intentions of this package is focused on making sure that we have effective collaboration for, across all stakeholders. So wherever you are in the industry, who, whether you're at policy level as, as a government, whether you're a big organisation, a small organisation, um, we need to work collaboratively to bring about that change. So it's just making sure we get it right and it's making sure that there are systems in place to support that collaborative. It's got to be more than words. Um, so we need to work out how we can translate that. But there's some great examples that, that Jim and Tom have touched on there already. Yeah, no, absolutely. Really fantastic um, examples that are already live and the potential to go even further is definitely um, the opportunities now. So uh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, that has come to the end of our questions. Um, thank you so much. This was such an engaging session and, and, and such fantastic views and, and, and a lively discussion as well. So just want to take this opportunity to say if you have missed any bits from today's panel, please don't worry. You can access um, the recordings on the Zero Waste Scotland microsite livingcircular.scot or going to zws.scot slash webinar2. Very catchy. Um, so <laughs> absolutely, if you have any further questions, please continue to send these through uh, via social media or by email and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, and But for now, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time today. Jim, Jane, 
Steve and Tom, really, really respect um, your opinions and the fact that you've taken the time to, to come along and chat today. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm sure that we're going to be keeping in close contact uh, moving forward with all these amazing ideas and plans as well. Um, just to be a reminder that the uh, consultations close on Monday the 22nd of August. As we keep saying, that seems like a far way away, but it is not. So please um, get involved, uh, take part, have your say, and we can um, continue to build on this together. We do have another webinar coming up on the 28th of July at 1pm. It's the next in our Living Circular uh, series, and it's focusing on the theme of food waste. So please join us for that. But in the meantime, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for taking part and everyone have a great day. Thank you.